Hi, this is Joe Avati, and welcome to Church Street Studios, my Sydney studio where I record my podcast, A Serious Chat with a Comedian. Well, today's guest is a lady who spent many years being the foreign correspondent on E! News between Australia and America, talking about fashion and entertainment. She's written two best-selling books, How to Tell a Man by His Shoes and How to Tell a Lady by Her Handbag. She's currently in a show called Undressed by Catherine Eisman, which is on Paramount+. Plus. So let's go and meet her. Catherine Eisman. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. I've been wanting to have you as a guest for a long time now. For at least a few days. For at least a couple of days. <laughs> for years since we emceed a friend's wedding together. A friend's, that's, that's exactly that. We should put a disclaimer in there. That we, should, we should, you know, say how we met. So we co emceed a wedding in Italy. Mm. Um, your friend Carly was getting married to my friend Dom. Mm. And uh, they had the both of us do Dom our wanted thing. you, Carly wanted me, and, yeah. and so a, a cute meet was. Was made, <laughs> yeah. and we met. Yeah. We shared. Yeah. We shared the, the microphone yes. and enormous cake. What was that big yeah, Italian? Yeah, it was cake? a miliafoglia they call Miliafoglia. it. So yes. they had like what ten different people come down and yeah. actually build this cake. It was, it was like in front the of the Colosseum. It was it that was amazing, in wasn't scale. It? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. But you know, I love shoes, as you know, yeah. and I probably I'm going to stick my neck out here. I'm probably going to say that I've probably got one of the biggest shoe collections in Australia. Men. And I, I don't you, see since we've spoke, you don't know this, but I built a purpose built shoe room that oh I had God. to fight the council for, to to have. It was probably as big as this room what, just for shoes. How is the council involved? Like, are you putting it on the roof? It of was, your house? It was on the roof of the oh, house, really? but was where, it really? but was where it? it was because my bedroom was upstairs. Where it was, it shut it out past a certain point. So they said you can go past a certain point, but you can't go high. I think we all know so, you've passed that point. I've passed that point, I have. So, <laughs> so you got it approved. I did get it approved, and it fit 300 shoes in there. Um, I'm and not then I got even married. phased by that. And then I got married. So I had to oh. start sharing that with my wife, and that just – I had to sell the house. Catherine, the house went. <laughs> I had to go. It was either her shoes next to mine or we leave, and we left. But did, anyway. you, did you marry someone who has a small or large shoe collection? Um, She's got a – you know, like not massive like me, yeah. but she she, have, she has yeah, she has because I would I yeah a lot of people find like they they marry mm-hmm. the opposite like so right. but, and even though usually the the women have the the greatest shoe collection mm-hmm. not always yeah. and, but. Um, in your case, but you went with someone who, who, so so she she understood it a little bit. Yes, she understood See, she's your really, problem. My, my wife's <laughs> very classy, um, but she's really understated. Yeah, right. And and you are uh, completely exact. the opposite. So, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm going, but, no, you're but, not understated. You're classy, but you're not understated. But I'm going, why? Like, I didn't get it. Like, why, yeah, how can you marry a guy like me with, you know, with all this bling and all the, you know, like, it's just. No, do you know why? Because, I mean, hopefully later I get to do a bit of a, a kind of reading of you. But, mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah, we haven't even explained why I'm a shoe expert, have we? Did no, I that's what, that's, that's, <laughs> this, is what, this is what we're getting at. So when, <laughs> when, um, when I was introduced to you at that time, I think it was at Dom's place, uh, when they were when they weren't married there yet, um, Dom goes, "Oh, Catherine has written a book about how to tell a man by his shoes," and I was like, "Oh my god!" And then no, no, and this is the way I knew I was meeting you. And that you'd written that book, so I turned up with a pair of snakeskin boots. I go, let's let's see what this chick's about. Let's see if she can figure it out. Do you remember what I said? I don't remember, but it was pretty spot on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the snakeskin. I feel like you don't even have to read the book, although I record it, to know what that says. I mean, and also in those days, it, mm. you know, it was you're a little. It was like a little, you know, single, little slippery like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Let's get to that later. Let's start. We're getting right off topic here. We started because I want to know, you've done so much work in the US, mm. okay, as a correspondent. Tell us about that life. Tell yeah. us about that before we move on to what you're doing now. Yeah, well, it kind of fits in perfectly that I, I wrote my my first book, How to Tell a Man by Shoes, and when I, yeah. when I was still at university here, yeah. and I went on a book tour to New York. 
And the truth is I really didn't have – w- the, the book was a bestseller here. It was a huge, huge seller yeah. in Australia and New Zealand. Um, but I hadn't actually secured any press in America. I was just yeah. going to show up and on my book tour yeah. I had a publisher there. And turns out that it really resonated with, with people. So I was booked on Good Morning America and the mm-hmm. Today Show and Fox News and all uh, the O'Reilly Fact, all these interesting shows. And so what happened from that is there was a really good viewer response from, from my appearances. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, yep. no accounting for taste. And so uh, they ended up creating a position for me as the, I guess I was the youngest on-air um, reporter on NBC. So I was with Today Show in New York yeah. um, on WNBC. Yeah. And so I got to, you know, write and interview the most interesting people, you know, whether it be, you know, President Clinton and Mayor Giuliani mm-hmm. or, you know, cover I used to cover New York Fashion Week, so Oscar de la Renta, Carolina yeah. Herrera, or just really everyday ordinary people who have done extraordinary things. It yeah. was kind of like someone handing this 21-year-old the keys yeah. to a pretty amazing city and said, go for it. So, yeah, it was kind of a wild, amazing time in my life. Yeah, tell us more about it. Tell us who did you meet, who, you know, who oh. influenced you, who was who, – who was, who lived up to your expectations? Who didn't? Uh- yeah. Well, do you know what? I learned so much about just being in the news world. So there was this um, there was this woman, Jane Hansen, who was like the part of, you know, the morning show, that, that yep. show that's out <clears throat> with uh, Reese Witherspoon right now um, and Jennifer Anderson. Well, sh- that's kind of loosely influenced by this woman, Jane Hansen, who was part of the first – dual female anchor team yep. for a morning show, which yep. was re- revolutionary at the yep. time. Um, and she became like somewhat of a mentor to me. And she was the person I did my first ever TV appearance with. Um, and she was so supportive and, and really like, you know, a lot of women often say like, oh, you know, I'm all about supporting women. But that's not always the case, mm. I, unfortunately. But she really was. And then this uh, producer, Nancy Han. Anyway, but I learned from the best in the business. And this guy, Chuck Scobber and Sue Simmons, who had been icons in television. I was working with Matt Lauer, Katie yep. Couric, who yep. was so great, who used to watch all of my spots and then on, on live on um, our crosses, she'd say, oh, I watch, wake up every morning and watch, you know, what's cool because I would find what's cool and yep. interesting so yep. from a social perspective or yep. whatever it might be trend-wise. And she's like, I wouldn't know what I'd do without you. And she was amazing as well. So you get to spend time with these people who are kind of icons in the news business. So they're, yep. they're like in many ways that you're great, my greatest influence yep. as, as a young journalist because it was all about integrity, about an extraordinary work ethic. Like yep. I would wake up at 3.30 a.m. My show was 5 to 7. Then I'd sometimes do the later morning show, go out all all day shoot interviews. Yeah. yeah, I'd come back. It was me and a cameraman, like on subways and stuff. Come back, write it, and then often do the 11 p.m. news. And then one night a week, I would cover an event, like maybe Radio City Music Hall, where I interviewed Bill Clinton and like, um, I mean icons, you know, like yeah. uh, so many people. And then you'd come back, write the story overnight, sit in the edit bay with your editor, turning it around, and then get like a bit more of a touch up, and then present it like behind the desk. But it, so it was this, you know, interesting to see these people, and also just how slick it was in America. Like it was whether it be the politicians. You know, so I emceed an event for you know Mayor Giuliani, and yep. or singing, you know, waltzing Matilda with Ted Turner, and you know, just these these really interesting people who are incredibly dynamic, incredibly disciplined, sometimes very ruthless, Mm -hmm. um, but very, very slick. And it was this, yeah, as I say, this extraordinary education. And I'm so grateful that I started my career in, I think, the hardest kind of possible environment for my career yep. because you then everything else you just kind of hold yourself to those standards so when I was doing something a project we'll talk about later um in a second but um undressed they were saying like with your work ethic like it's like 15 hour days yep. 16 hour days on in heels whatever it takes get it done and yep. so that was great but then also interviewing like Sarah Jessica Parker mm. who was part of the influence yeah. of me wanting to come to America because yeah. of um Sex and Sex the City, and, the City yeah, of course, and yeah. and, and, and you know, anyway, just just everyone. And how how different was working in New York to LA? Because I'm listening to you speaking then, and I'm going, yeah, right, okay, that sounds like New York people. It doesn't sound like LA people, does no, it? No, no. it's not. LA is very different. LA, listen, LA is 
the best in, in LA are the, are the best in the world. As yeah. well. It's not like they're a second mm. tier. It's just business is done so differently there. So for me, I became, I'm, I think in my core, I think, and you probably are too, I'm very New York. I'm yeah. very direct. <laughs> I'm very yeah. honest. Yeah. I'm well intended. Like, yeah. so I feel like I don't have to pretend to be something else because I, my, I'm not backstabbing. I yeah. am not malicious, yeah. but I am very direct and I love to know, go into a meeting and you know in that meeting whether the di- it's going to happen or not. Yeah. Like they'll tell yeah. you and yeah. there's a certain kind of brutality yeah. to that candor, but I like it, especially yeah. in news it was like that. And then I remember I moved to L.A., and it was you never have a bad meeting in LA. Mm-hmm. Like every you walk out of every meeting, and I remember, and you're like, that was amazing, and you're like, it didn't mean anything. anything it yeah. didn't mean anything, and and it took me a while to kind of figure out that it has it's it's much more polite, it's a little bit more slower moving. Like projects yeah. can take twenty years, films to be made, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the best and brightest there. Uh, are very, very smart, very, very dynamic as well. It's just a different language. Yeah. So I started, went, I went from News NBC to E! News. So I was head of fashion lifestyle for E! News. And so I would I originally started pitching all these ideas of I thought were interesting, like, concepts. For, like, these are really interesting segments or different, you know, ideas. And then the question I'd get back was like, so which celebrities attached to it? And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. And mm. I was like, oh, it doesn't, the idea alone didn't necessarily yeah. have the validity unless you had like Taylor Swift doing the segment with you. And so it's a very celebrity driven culture. And so that was also an education. Yeah. And now being in the media in Australia, how does that, mm. what, what, what are your observations on how it differs? Because I, I found, which we, we talked about before, is, is if I do not go in, in, in a limousine in Toronto or Montreal or New York, mm. they don't they don't take you seriously, whereas here you're a, you're a wanker. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's a – and, and having spent a lot of time in, in America on tours, like sometimes nine months, when you come back, you actually have to realign because yeah. there it's me, 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 and <laughs> – and, here, if you, you actually feel yourself, you feel that you're talking about yourself too much, mm-hmm. and you just it just doesn't sit right in Australia. It's true. What, what, what's your observations? Because you've spent a lot more time in America and mm. obviously here. Mm. Mm. And I got the limo to this podcast because <laughs> I wanted to be awake. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I. It is. I just as I had to kind of relearn how. Not just to do business, but like how to relate to people when I moved from New York to LA. Just as when I first moved to New York, I had to like toughen up and relearn it then. When I came back to Australia, even though I feel very Australian, I purposely never lost my accent, even though I've been away like my entire adult life. So intrinsically, my sense of humor is very Australian, but... I I think there's sometimes like you have a bit of that. In, I have like that intensity that, you know, and like I want to do this. And it's not. And, and so and sometimes that doesn't sit as well here. So yeah. it's like I remember once um, the head of one of the biggest networks in Australia who who was kind of like a, a titan in the media landscape, who I respected enormously, but was that real old school Aussie like that. Yeah, a bit like not not like New York, but a bit like yeah, you yeah. know. And I remember we had a meeting, and I I was I was at, I was working news at the time, and he's like, "You're too ambitious. You're too ambitious." And I'm like, and I remember thinking, "What does that even mean? Yeah, like, how what can you be too ambitious?" Well, it's, and it's also I think ambition often is connected with like selfishness mm. or like. Um, arrogance mm-hmm. or or that you're trying to take something away from anyone else mm. and it's like no when i just did my show we created you know 60 jobs like 70 maybe more jobs for people like that's contributing to the economy that's doing it that's and then the show itself is about helping people so i think that i don't like that that part of the culture yeah. that your yeah. ambition is mm. detrimental it's, it's like trying to psh, bring light to, to for it's actually not selfishly driven in most cases certainly in mine well, you know not I can't say most but certainly mine but also yeah there's just a different way of doing you know I, I'm I think I'm still figuring it out to be totally honest I haven't been back that long and um I just think okay you know what's the one universal language and that's like kindness yeah. so if you're just a kind person hopefully the rest kind of gets you know 
comes out in the wash. Yeah. But but it is different here and and people don't like divas here. And I think that's no, that, a good thing. Yeah. Like I think that especially in LA, I think you, you have a lot of yes people around you. Yeah. I didn't, but mm. like the, you know, the bigger the, your star gets and, yeah. and suddenly in, as actors, I'm not an actor, but you have all these yes people. And I think that's really unhealthy for the psyche. And I think that's where a lot of uh, anxiety and depression and all these things, because it's an unnatural way of being. It's about like you need roadblocks in your life to overcome obstacles, to get stronger. And if you don't have people pushing back, you're in this kind of free fall. Sure. And yep. so I do think Australia has that going for it, that yep. no matter how successful you get, that you better not get too big for your bridges, you know, bridges. Yeah. And and I think that's much healthier on a human level. Yeah. And I do, and that connects with me. Like yeah. my family, I grew up, I don't yeah. know if your family, but like you better get quick at making a joke about yourself because yeah. it's coming from yeah. someone else in the family yeah, really right. quickly. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so we all got like very quick, yeah. you know. Yeah. And but that, that's yeah. sort of self-deprecation that we have mm. this, uh, in that Australian sense of humor. I found yeah. helped me overseas. Yeah. Did you find that? Because we, we, you'd go to some places and you'd, you'd be selling out big stadiums and they're used to stars coming there mm. being divas. And we weren't. So my whole crew were Australian. My tour manager was my uncle. The guy who looked after the merchandise was was a mate of mine. The publicist was an Australian girl. Right. So they've gone, hey, you guys are you you're you're pretty normal for yes. someone of this sort of size to sell yeah. out these kind of venues. Mm. And we're like, Yeah, just Aussies, you know. Yeah. And that Helped a lot. Helps a lot. It's very refreshing. And I do think it's one of the kind of the secrets to why I think Australians do do well overseas. Yep. Because yes, there's there's talent and you've and and there are less layers in every industry. So you have to do much many more roles within a job. Whereas yep. in America there's it's such a bigger economy, so many yep. so it's a bit more conveyor belt sometimes when yep. you're in so I think you have a breadth of um, experiences that you can bring in any particular job, not only entertainment, but any particular marketing or whatever it might be. Yep. But I think the other side is, is this exact same thing: is that you, you, you're human. You're not. You're not a diva. You, you're there to do the job. You're there to be nice. You have respect for yep. other people. And I think it's one of actually the best qualities of yep. being Australian, yep. and why it's so nice to come back. Yeah. Um, not that, it, that there aren't really nice people overseas, but it's just expected. it's a machine there, isn't it's, it? It's, it's yeah. a you feel it's a whole process. Yeah, it is. A so when you did all that media for your mm. book, mm. did you really see it moving after that? Did like oh yeah, the book. We, yeah, it was amazing. The book became a bestseller in America, which is yeah. great. And then we sold. I think it was in like. I don't know, like 15 languages and things. Yeah. So it became this whole thing. And I think it really touched on a nerve where people felt like I always was fat. I mean, the reason I wrote the book was I, I mean, just, we'll talk about that, but like I always felt like people looked at fashion and they mm -hmm. thought it was superficial, but it's like a visual reflection of subconscious choices you've made Absolutely. and conscious. Yeah. So it's an amazing way to like understand someone because yeah. you can't necessarily read someone's mind, but you can, and what I have done, you can read their wardrobe, which is a reflection of where their mind was when they yeah. were going shopping or getting dressed that morning. Yeah. And so um, I think it really touched on that nerve. And at the time I was single and I wrote it like, how many bad dates do we have to go on? Yeah. Like, just read it. How to tell me my shoes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're just like three less bad dates, you know, yeah. this this week. Just kidding. No. Yeah. And <laughs> it's like I don't, I don't want to look at your face on your Tinder profile. Just pull me a, a, a photo of, the, of three of your pairs of your shoes, and I'll figure out if I'm going to swipe left or right. Hundred percent, or even one yeah. or two, maybe. Yeah. You know, in your yeah. case, maybe twenty. And yeah. then that's just like a, that's just like the five yeah. percent, you know, of your wardrobe. But but anyway, so it's a it you know it really made a big impact, and it really that book and that trip obviously just set my mm. i was meant to just go for a couple you know a couple of weeks yeah. and then i just didn't come back what year was that oh my god don't age me but that was that was in 2002 babe yeah yeah, yeah right that was okay. a while ago so okay let's talk about the book okay so you wrote the that was your first book right mm. how to tell a man by his shoes mm. what can you tell us about a man by his shoes oh my gosh you can tell so much yeah you can tell um and people always say, oh, you can tell a man by his watch. I'm like, no. You can tell his, who he wants to be by his watch. His, right. But his shoes are who he is. Yeah, right. And so, and you can look at all the different clues, and that's what I do on Undress, my show. But but if you just focus on the shoes for a second, mm -hmm. you know, there's what's interesting about a pair of, about any shoes, men or women, mm -hmm. is that 
they're a fashion item, but they're the most pragmatic component of our wardrobe. Like you have to actually walk in them. You have to move in them. Like you can't, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? They're, mm-hmm. Whereas you, a piece of jewelry is purely decorative. Yep. That is like at its core utilitarian. So it's about the balance between how much practicality they want versus how much aesthetic do they want to be are they rebellious? Are they in sales with a pointy toe with sales? Do they have a thick soul, which is someone who's usually sensitive, who mm-hmm. hides it really well, who people think isn't sensitive but but is? <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I know, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, are they immaculate and someone who likes to take care of their mm-hmm. things and is mm-hmm. kind of a little bit, you know, mm. OCD but in the, in the best possible yeah. way? Or are they scruffy and just really have disregard for that and just – live in a more don't like to obsess about Mm -hmm. um figurative objects and more um abstract in their thinking so there's just suede is a little more old school Mm -hmm. so like more traditional left of center Mm -hmm. someone who's kind of connects with traditional values whereas pointy someone who is you know wants to feel like they've got their finger on the pulse, very future-focused, um, wanting to get ahead. Monk strap can – is you know, anyway, there's, there's this – Yeah, no, no, okay, this is it's fascinating. Like, yeah, this yeah. is like, yeah, we could do this, guys, and welcome to an hour of this. <laughs> and then we could talk and, – yeah. and then is it a colourful, is it a converse um, – What about sneakers, someone who just collects sneakers and wears yeah, sneakers, sneakers all the time? sneakers, I mean – What does that say? Well, that, I mean – so it depends what type of sneakers you collect, but a, a lot of guys who collect sneakers, there's someone who, and I bet they're probably in really good condition, and that's someone who um, loves design, loves mm-hmm. things that are quite beautiful, has a real appreciation, has very high standards for how they live and how they, mm-hmm. and not just in terms of mm-hmm. make them, make, like I would assume they would take good care of those shoes, but they would also like to be quite tidy and things to be, and don't like people who are slobbish, couldn't go out with yeah. someone who was a total slob. That would really yeah. irk them or they might be attracted to it and then try and change them, you know, things yeah. like that because they, yeah. um, and who isn't that flexible in the way that they live their life. Like people have to kind of bend around them versus them bending around. So and this is enough about you here. <laughs> how much of this is you? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just really interested how – well, okay. Let me say this. And Converse, for example, yeah. like a Converse is like someone who is – Forever young, kind of that Peter Pan type. Right. You see a lot of that in LA. Yeah. Like I'd go into business yeah. meetings, mm-hmm. like very senior people, and they'd wear jeans, and even a shirt, maybe even a blazer, and they all have their Converse on. Like yep. it's there, it's the it's a look there, and that's someone who wants to maintain a sense of playfulness their mm-hmm. whole life, and has that healthy dose of immaturity. Is actually loyal, but they be- need a long leash. You know, right. if they if you try and yeah. rein them in, like yeah. they rebel against that, and they're yeah. not loyal. But if you let them do their thing, they come back. So yeah, there's a lot. Because men typically don't own a lot of pairs of shoes. Like some likes, like mm-hmm. mate, I own a pair of sneakers, a pair of dress shoes, maybe a brown and black. So what does that say? Yeah, I mean that's someone who is not interested in. The, their appearance in terms of trying to impress people. They're someone who is more about what they do. They think mm-hmm. their value and their worth is connected to their contribution, mm-hmm. not their collection. Yeah, right. Um, but, and it is true. And what I found in my kind of extensive years of research was that often even someone who has a, a vast shoe collection, not as vast mm. as your, your – but but even you would fall into yeah. this category, would either have a lot of different shoes but there's yeah. only a couple that they wear yeah. or they would notice that of that shoe collection they're kind of duplicates or very similar duplicates of the same styles repeated right. again and again and they're the ones that they wear. Yeah. So even if you – whether you have two pairs of shoes in your wardrobe or you have – 300 you will still be able to be judged by by the shoes that you wear Mm -hmm. and then if i was to go a deep dive which i do on undress the show it's also the things that you collect which are access points interesting things for me to understand like the thinking behind why people want to own something but but display it and what that says Mm. about you but you don't Mm. actually feel comfortable stepping into that version of yourself yet yeah yeah, that's interesting because the, 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 there were some pairs of shoes which I had bought, which I had not worn. There was one pair of shoes, Jimmy Choo, that I bought that I never wore until the day I got married. I wore them when I got married. So you thought, say, how long before you got married did you buy them? Oh, at least probably nine, ten years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I bought them. 
thought, yeah, cool, these are great. Yeah, I never wore, never wore them until it just, they, they just went with the suit that I got made. Yeah. You know? But there's also something deeper. What what shoes were they? Just um, They were a black shoe, like a slip-on, but it had yeah. like a tassel at the front. Yeah. Like a really... Elaborate with a, with one. Yeah, elaborate tassel. Yeah. And, I thought, oh, and it was, and also you felt too, it felt a bit absurd. And yeah. Bit too, 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 and yeah. it didn't look cool, but when you were getting married, the extravagance of them and the old school formality of them mm. felt right because you were doing something that was the most serious thing you've ever done. Geez, you're good. Yeah. Geez, you're good. Yeah. Um, there, were, there was also a pair of Christian Louboutins that I bought. So I was in the store in Paris, so their, their main mm. store there, mm. and- it's I lovely. had a look around and I said, yeah, this is kind of all right. I said, have you got anything new? She goes, you know what? This box has just arrived. Let's see what's in here. So she took out this shoe. It was a black boot, completely sequins. Oh, wow. But when you flick the sequin the other way, it was gold. Ooh. I said, oh, my God. I said, I'm having them. I said, I don't care how much it is. Just And I was. I said, if I buy these, am I the first person in the world to own these mm. boots? She goes, yes. Mm. And, you know, I wore them once mm. and they were – in the room, I had a special dis- box in my bedroom, where, where, and that's where they stayed mm. for yeah, the rest well, of the time. Well, that that shoe, there's two things about it. One's interesting is that you wanted to. That's that's the idealized version of who you want to be with your career and yeah. like the true star, and that you were the first person to wear it. So there's so you haven't fully. You don't. You you're not fully at peace with that. And but that there's that drive that you you want it, but you're a little bit still ashamed about mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. but you still will need to have it. And mm-hmm. so, you, that's what that shoe represents to you. It's this idea of being a big star, super prestigious, mm-hmm. the first of its kind. You know, from the st- you know yeah. from at the heartbeat of it. But you do feel, and also because we do live in Australia and you probably get like beaten up if you yeah. remember. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> just by me, if yeah. no one else. <laughs> um, yeah. And and so you feel a bit absurd with that mm. because that is very much like, the, even though it's fr- obviously very French, it's that that is like you're talking about the, the mechanics and the, the system, the machine mm. of mm. stardom. Like that is that shoe yeah. and you don't feel totally comfortable yeah. As that yeah, that's true. That's good. Now, you also wrote a book about women, right, and how to tell a woman by her handbag. Mm. And I said, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think women's handbags are really interesting because it's not just something that ex- is external, but there's the contents of your bag. And there's all this research that shows that I think it's like nearly 90% of women would absolutely be irate if you looked inside her handbag mm. even if it was like your the husband the yep. partner the best friend whatever yep. it is it's this kind of final frontier of female privacy but then the interesting thing is the history of handbags and so we really see them even though they've been around for a very long time this experience you know men would often wear bags mm. by the way in like ancient greece and and but it was in the 20s when the flapper area uh, era occurred where women were starting to take that, you know, like the mesh bags, you know, that kind of was reinvented as the glow mesh bag, but right, they had yep. the heavily embellished metal bags mm-hmm. at that period. And so that was the first time that women had kind of indep- in, in Western society, women had independent travel. So rather than a chaperone, they could carry their own money, their own uh objects right. in the form of a bag. So and we see over the course of um the last, you know, thousand years or whatever it is, the connection between the feminist movement and the handbag and the shape are actually in- inextricably linked. It's it's right. fascinating thing. So a handbag is much more than ju- and, and then of course like when men think of like okay you, men want the Ferrari women want the Hermes you know Birkin or mm-hmm. whatever it is it's also very much a, a status symbol um, and you're more likely to be more loyal to the handbag you might change your shoes based on your mood each day mm-hmm. whereas men I think are usually typically more loyal because they have fewer mm-hmm. shoes whereas a handbag it's a hassle to move the contents you might have your evening one you know and then you're wearing that for a few months and then you swap it out or whatever or your weekend one so it's a more interesting um, way to understand someone's true personality versus they're just their mood which could mm. be a top 
right? Right. Um, but yeah, you can tell a lot about a woman, as my book says, about who they are by their handbag. Yeah. And who, like, did you find that there were a lot more women buying that book than men? What? Yeah, men. men. <laughs> <laughs> if it was like how to woman buy her bra, you know, yeah, it would have yeah. been a bestseller, you know, yeah. as long as it was illustrated. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, women, I think, uh, you know, for my first book, it was it was men, but it was also like a lot of women who bought yeah. How to Tell a, woman, a Man by Your Shoes. Yeah. And then with How to Tell a Woman by a Handbag, it was very largely women buying mm. it. Like mm. men should have, would have been wise to, but I don't think yeah. they even think that they could go and buy a book to help them <laughs> with the dating thing. Um, but, yeah, it's also fun. Like people enjoyed identifying themselves and then their best friend and their boss yeah. and, you yeah, know, right. all yeah. that kind of stuff. And also guys who were like – you know, serial sort of daters who who think, you know what, what what are the kind of shoes that I should be wearing yes. to try and hundred percent get myself a hot chick. And it's really interesting. Like if you look at through history, like if Studio Fifty Four, which was arguably the mm. hottest nightclub mm. in yeah. the world, and the bouncer there, he decided who came in yeah. based on the shoes of, right. the, of the guy. Yeah, wow. So you might have thought, oh, I've got, you know, just spent, you know, yeah, two yeah. grand on this, like, yeah. slick outfit. And he would look at the shoes, shoes unless you were, like, you know, an icon at the time. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Andy Warhol or something. Yeah. But even then he would have. But And that's interesting. And then also we've always had, like, our mothers and grandmothers tell, oh, make sure the mm. shoes, you know, so – Men would be wise to kind yeah. of give it a little bit of extra thought to the, yeah. sh- the footwear they yeah, put on, cool. even for business. Yep. Now, before we get to your show, mm. right? How, okay. So, what were you like as 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 a young, per- you know, like a girl? What, what, how did you how did you know that you had this ability to mm. be able to look at someone, see what they were wearing, because that's yeah. what the show's about now, or their mm. whole actual uh, get up, mm-hmm. the whole thing from head to toe. When did you first start realising that you had the ability to be able to tell someone's the characteristics from, from what they were wearing or their handbag or their shoes? Yeah, it's a good question. So do you know what? There's the different kind of turning points. Like I always had an obsession with, with clothing and right. my grandparents on both sides were in the fashion business, mm-hmm. you know, the schmutter business, you know. Yeah. So they came from Europe and kind of built, you know, big businesses here and um, and my grandmother – Actually, on both sides, they were just always loved. She would always, you know, talk about the quality. Quality. Mm-hmm. We would always yeah. joke, what yeah. about the quality, you know? The and, quality. And I remember they went, took me to Surface Paradise over the holidays, you know, when I was a kid. And they bought me, like, my first, like, Italian leather shoes. And I think they were a little bit too tight, but I didn't tell them because they didn't have the size <laughs> up. And I wanted them so much and yeah. I slept in them. <laughs> and so I've always had this deep obsession with, with clothing mm. and, and particularly shoes, but really love it. And I remember going to Italy, talking about Italy, going mm. to Italy on a family vacation with my dad and my brother when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. And we were at the Venice train station. My father went off to get tickets mm-hmm. and asked my brother and I to watch our suitcases. Yeah. And this guy, my brother wanders off looking in a shop. And then this guy, I remember wearing like a camel colored cashmere coat and um, brown monk strap leather shoes, all look very brand new, came up and started asking me directions in Italian, which obviously makes zero sense because yeah. I don't speak Italian and I didn't know how to get around and you were 10. Venice and I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. A, yeah, there's right. a lot that's gone wrong with yeah. the story, right? Yeah. Anyway, I remember just being transfixed by him. I remember every detail of him, like really studying mm-hmm. him and that's where I've been kind of called like a fashion profiler because I really look at details. I think mm-hmm. they're an interesting access point to bigger things. And my father came back. He's like, where's our video camera? I said, Dad, there was this man and his face didn't match his clothes. It mm. must have been him. And it made no logical sense. How could it? Because I was talking to him. Yeah. But I just knew this guy was a lie. I yeah. knew his outfit was a lie. I right. just knew it. Yeah. And so we looked around and sure enough, we see he's poking his head out and he's with an accomplice whose clothes did match his face wearing yeah. you know, raggedy old yeah. things. We chase them down through the train station, go to this secluded part. I mean, you know, this is very dangerous. Like yes, we could have been yes, stabbed, right, absolutely. my father and I. And they started talking, you know, in Italian. Did, and my father just reached forward, opened the the um, tennis bag that he had. And inside one thing, our camcorder, camera. you know, video yeah. camera. And then we, we kind of ran off, you know. And, and so I remember at that age being very aware, saying that this is... 
insight that I have and it's very mm. intuitive. And mm. obviously over the course of my career, I've studied it yeah. from research, but it is deeply tr- intuitive. And I said, I remember being like, no, trust it. Mm. And and I've never been wrong. Like I, yeah. it's just this kind of bizarre little kind of yeah. superpower I have. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes I, I, you know, someone will say, oh, mate, what do you, th- I've got, you know, I'm seeing this girl, what do you think? And as soon as, you know, I'm in their presence, I'm like, what are you doing with this girl, man? Can't you just see his trouble? You know, and people just can't see it, can they? They just cannot see it. it it's very, very interesting. It's very that- interesting. And also like how, you know, in Undressed um, on Paramount Plus streaming now, mm-hmm. um, you can, it's true, you can watch it. There's so, we go into it so much, yeah. nine hours of this. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, okay, let's so talk about it, yeah. So tell us about your show now. Come on, just- yeah, so I came back from America about two years ago and had a conversation with this incredible producer, Bruna Papandrea from Made Up Stories, who's done Big Little Lies, Nine Perfect mm-hmm. Strangers, Anatomy of a Scandal, yeah. Lucky Scholar Life. I've of Bruna. I think she's actually Calabrese. Yes, yeah. I think she, yeah, I think, I think she, don't quote me on that, mm-hmm. but I think maybe. Someone was telling me about her. It yeah. wasn't you, it was someone else. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. Great. She's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. And her husband, Steve, also amazing. And they have this company, Made Up Stories. Everything you want to watch on television or yeah. in the film, The Dry, I mean, everything, yeah. they basically make it. And we were chatting and she's not that interested in fashion, so mm-hmm. it was the perfect conversation to have because yeah. she had, was familiar with my books. And um, and I, I said, oh, do you want me to do a reading for you and I did it and she was kind of like whoa what is this this is this kind of really I think she said it was kind of delighted and surprised her just how accurate it was how I was seeing her but not just reading who she was but reading where she she was like she's so formidable as a person and how she could express that in a way that was more kind of galvanizing uh through fashion and it kind of set her off and wasn't my intention on this kind of path of where she started embracing it more and feeling more and more in her own skin in in different items and clothing and I was like we should do a show and she was like yes we should and Mm -hmm. when she puts her mind to something and and when I put my mind to it it's this it was this amazing team and then we brought in um and then Eden Gaha who's in the world of who's extraordinary he does Celebrity Apprentice and MasterChef and all stuff in the USA and he loved it and so he and he's so brilliant and he's got a great mind and and then we got Marcel our director and Jane Cho and this amazing group of people and I created with them uh, Undressed with Catherine Eisman which is a um, very premium um, style show we have a director it's shot mm-hmm. like your favorite premium script shows but it's reality based it's, yep. ba- it's it is the truth so yep. it's almost documentary and it is streaming right now on paramount plus and the premise of it is is what if there was this person which is me who could look at what you're wearing and tell the the deepest, truest parts of who you are and not only who you are in this moment but who you want to be and how you are hurting your chances of becoming that or afraid to step into that. And what if I, by changing your clothes I could change your life? And so we get a group of people, 20-something people from all walks of life. I've never met them before. Yep. They've never met each other before and they participate in this kind of, kind of quite – groundbreaking social experiment where yep. they come into this room and one by one I invite them, I tell, ask their name, invite them to the centre of the circle and I say, I'm Catherine, mm-hmm. what's your name? Mm-hmm. I'm Joe. you know, yep. would you like to have a reading? And it is incredibly emotional and it's unlike any show out there where these people who are so brave, they're not trying to become reality stars, they're there because for a variety of reasons yep. they wanted to be there yep. and some of them don't, they were there for one reason, left realising or something else. Yeah. And I kind of undress them metaphorically by reading their clothing and then we articulate what this version of themselves in so that the end of this show, it's not a makeover show, it's so they look in the mirror and they say, I finally see me, I see me. And it's not about me putting them in an outfit and then they take it off and it's it, they go back to the ways. It's like sh- fundamentally shifting how they view themselves and then using fashion as a tool to express that, yes, to the wider world, but most importantly to themselves. And so you get to follow this journey of these people and learn so much as, as a viewer about your own fashion choices where you might be selling yourself short, how you can enhance your 
experience of life holistically yeah. through the tool that is and the language, the universal language of fashion. And then you get to see what happens and, and it's um it's an amazing, amazing show. So yeah, and it's all nine episodes have now dropped on Paramount Plus. So you can kind of binge it, which is what a lot of people are oh, doing. Oh great. Yeah. And so I'm, we're going to do a reading on me soon in a second, but okay. So you're married to Simon Reynolds. You got two kids. Now, do you do you um, like if Simon wears something? <laughs> do, do you do you say to him, like, okay, you're going to this important meeting. You should not be wearing that. You should be wearing something else. Yeah, you know, I've like, done how, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How I've do done you that. how do you dress? For yeah. success. Yeah. Well, it depends. Success is obviously so subjective yeah. because my idea of success and, and his or yours mm. are often very different. So it's about articulating what your version of success is. So if you're in a creative field, you know, wearing a power suit may not be the right mm. vibe because yeah. it might look dated, antiquated, yeah. boring, yeah. where if you wear like some – cool pair of sneakers, rep jeans, whatever, and creative, and you wear it to a legal office, you know, you'll you'll be fine. <laughs> so so it's subjective. But there are kind of key things. Like um, if you want to feel more powerful, there's nothing better than a square shoulder. When you look mm-hmm. at military jackets internationally, yeah. historically, they always have a square shoulder. Uh, women's movement in the 80s, the power suit. And so... What I look into and explore, and you'll see it on Undress with Catherine Eisenman, but the what is, it's not just, yes, there's the fashion history component of why wearing that is connected to feeling more powerful, feeling strong, mm. whatever. But there's also the biological explanation for why this has this impact on the way you feel and the way that people perceive you. And so it's about ratios. So when you have a square shoulder, it creates more powerful um, uh, shoulder to, to, to hip yeah, ratio. Right. Creates that triangle, that, right? That V, yeah. The, exactly, the yeah. V, exactly, inverse triangle, exactly. Yeah. And so that is like just like when you're out in nature and a bear comes up to you and what are you meant to do? you meant to stand up, put your jacket up and look as big as possible. We're animals. We're animals. Yeah. And so without having to look like a lunatic standing up with your dick, putting your shoulder <laughs> yeah, up, yeah, wave, yeah. it creates a sense of gravitas, of scale, of strength, of size. And so that is all happening subconsciously, subliminally. Um, but as human interaction is based on animal, it's like mm-hmm. we're animals still mm-hmm. interacting. That is what's happening. It's dominant. It's dominance is what mm. you see. So if you want to feel dominant in a meeting or feel powerful in a meeting or be taken seriously, a, a square jacket or something that has shoulder pads or something like that within reason, mm-hmm. obviously, is a really great way to go. And that's irrespective of what creative or non-creative field you might be in. So I really am interested in the the item of clothing the and the reasoning, the true multifaceted reasonings mm-hmm. why it changes the way you feel and changes the way the world perceives you. Yeah. And that is so different to what we see normally in style shows or anything in fashion where yeah. it's like, oh, it's on trend, you yeah. know, and, uh, oh, that makes you look fat, you know. I don't, and that is never part of the conversation of this show. Yeah. Okay, here's a question for you. What, what do you think of um, parents that dress either their twins or like two sisters who are only, you know, a year or two apart, exactly the same. What's what's that about? Do it as long as you can. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's um, that about? Well, I think, I mean, there's, I think, listen, I think for photo opportunities different to like someone who does it day in, day out. Like I've, I've got two girls that mm-hmm. are like four and a half years apart mm-hmm. and I have put them in outfits that kind of either matching mm-hmm. or like, no, I mean identical. By. Like, like you know, yeah. there, there could be a four-year-old, a, a five-year-old sister, and a three-year-old yeah. sister, and they wear a, the identical. But is it like, clothes. is it for like a, a holiday Christmas card, or no, is it no. for just you, everyday you see, life? You see them in shopping. You know, you see okay. them at Westfield. Yeah, look, I think that if it's, I get it, if it's for like a special occasion mm-hmm. or a photo or something, because it can be cute. Mm-hmm. Even the mum can be matching sometimes, you know, uh-huh. in in a photo, but. If it's like every day and they're dressing that, that's someone I would consider that someone who, unless the kids really enjoy it, mm-hmm. so that let's not forget that component. But if it's brought on by, and let's assume it is the mother, could have been the dad, mm. but probably mm. the mom. Um, but who knows? Um, 
it would be someone trying to control like the narrative of their kids of how yeah. they're perceived. It's an extension of themselves. Yeah. They want to look like this very together, perfect family and that's what the kid. And so they might be putting that expectation onto their children mm-hmm. if it was every day. Mm-hmm. But as I say, I have done it in the past <laughs> occasionally yeah. and I think it is maybe there is an element of that in there what I'm do- yeah. saying as well and also just the cute factor as well. We can't, mm-hmm. you know, there is sometimes just that. Right. But, yeah, I think that would be a controlling comp- right. a, a, a personality. Okay, cool. What's next for you, Catherine? Where are you going after this? So Are you going to John do another I, season? Yeah, well, we, the show just came out, so mm-hmm. hopefully. But, but a lot of people are talking about it. Yeah. Like uh, I mentioned to a few people that I'm having you on as a guest, and they're like, yeah, we know, we have heard about it, we've seen it, we've seen the promos. Yeah. So it's... It's getting a bit of traction. Yeah, it's going really well. I mean, it's so exciting because people, I get let, what I love so much is, okay, first I love that these people's lives are completely transformed. So yeah. every day I get these messages from them. And yeah. then I also get so many messages, so every day, the most beautiful heartfelt messages from people watching it, just saying like, oh my God, I've just been crying for like four hours watching. So mm. I've completely, you've completely changed the way I want to live my life yep. and dress. And so it is, it's so rare, like in, and it's, when you go into media, like you yep. and I have, in you're yep. in a different way, but you're ultimately you love like making people happy or like entertaining people or teaching people. There's some component to that. Yep. That's why you're drawn to it because it's not a natural yep. thing to do to stand in front of a crowd or whatever, yeah. unless you had a motivation behind it. And so, for me, it's been deeply gratifying to see like, oh. This is not just doing well as a show, but this is like changing people's lives. Like that, how often do you get to say that? And I'm really grateful for that. Um, so it's exciting to to kind of see the life that it takes on as a show and for people to discover Undressed with Catherine Eisman. But also I've got a sock line, which we just start, launched on. Yeah, tell um, us about that. Yeah, yeah, so I've got a sock line called, I, I did it, I launched it in 2018 mm-hmm. and it's called High Heel Jungle. And we are in David Jones and the iconic Nordstrom and Free People and um, many, many stores mm-hmm. around the globe, a lot of boutiques. And the idea of it was is kind of not dissimilar to the show. Is It's the idea of that getting dressed every day should be a empowering and joyful form of self-expression because you're partaking in that experience every day. You're dressing yourself. Yep. You can't go out naked. Yep. So why not own it? And enjoy it mm-hmm. and use it as mess key messaging for yourself in the world. And so we've, you know, the Kardashians have won an Elf fan and all these celebrities and it's been, you know, celebrated. But most importantly, I love walking down the street and seeing someone at my, and my daughter Capri, who's yeah. nine, is yeah. like the king of, the uh, queen of spotting it. Yeah. Mom, she's wearing your socks. Wearing your socks. <laughs> well, I, what is it about the socks? I mean, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll put up a picture. I don't know, yeah. but what is it? Explain to us okay, about so they're, so why they're, it's yeah, successful. Yeah, so it's, it's not like a normal sock company so right. it's like we do a lot of beautiful sheer socks so they're mm-hmm. beautiful for the holidays so or, or parties or they're sheer tulle and they might have like uh stars and moons mm-hmm. on it or handmade floral embellishments or yeah embroidered and you can wear them with heels you can wear them with loafers with slides and so they're very fashion forward yep. or metallic sheer you know like lurex m- metallic mm. lurex socks that are really mm. cool or kind of nubbly woolen ones that you scrunch up boots or we've got you know amazing tights we've got mercury tights that are like liquid satin like made out of silk mm. on your legs that are completely opaque and just so hot with heels but even with boots and and so it's basically I took a category where I felt like it was very very lacking I think who there's just not mm. many exciting socks out there and or, or tights even to be honest and just to infuse it with so much fashion and 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 so that you could wear everything that you normally wear every single day and then you swap out you put on this pair of socks you put on these tights it, or stockings and you are literally the most fashionable fabulous person in the room any room you walk into and it doesn't break the bank you don't have to buy a whole new wardrobe and it's fun and people will ask you oh my god where are they from where are they from and so it's a conversation starter so it's it's very exciting i design them and yeah. and, and run that so now that i've finished filming the show i've kind of we, we have so much expansion and yeah. so i'm kind of Head first into that as well. And did you say the Kardashians wore? Oh yeah. Like oh a yeah. Bunch of course of the, they did. Well, no, no. The few of them, who, who I else, think. Who um, else has worn, oh, worn them? Um, everyone from Michelle Obama has worn yeah. them. Sarah Jessica Parker, Elle Fanning, um, Zoe Deutsch, um, a bunch of the Kardashians, Hailey Bieber. Um, 
like like a lot, yeah. a lot of pe- a lot of people. So, and I often don't know, so I will see it like pop up and um. On is, is, there an Insta- is there an Instagram page just for yeah, for them? yeah. High Heel Jungle official? Okay, yeah, All right. High Heel Jungle, yeah, and you can Google it, but yeah, yeah. so you could get it on the website or different source. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, it's just so exciting to mm-hmm. see, and to, and then I get to design it, which is so fun, you know, because yeah. you get to I've got flamingo ones for wild thing. We've got statement socks that said like during lockdown we did these fully vac socks, which is sold out. <laughs> were huge and like yeah, right. so many yeah. different stars wore them, but they were. It's just a fun thing. Have you got one that says fully waxed for... Fully waxed for you, for, 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 yeah, for the for, Italians. Yeah, for the Italians too. <laughs> Hairy Back, chest. Sack and crack, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> On the sole. Once you once you get that far, it's too late to turn back, right? Uh, fully... Yeah, so I was going to do waxed and waxed, you know what I mean? Um, but no, I don't have anything waxed. But I do... Have, we have so many other funny things. We've got leave me alone. We've got... Oh, and some what like some rude ones I won't say here okay. as well. But like the idea of like make it this the ultimate statement song. Yeah. And you can show it or you yeah. can hide it under yeah. your jeans or your yeah. suit. And you could just finally say with your you know, wear your heart on your ankle instead of your yeah. sleeve. Yeah, cool. All right, before we do a reading on me, I always ask this question of all my guests. What do you do every day to live your best life? Oh, I like that. Um what I try and do is before I go to bed, I go kind of run through the things that I – because we often go through the things that went wrong during the day, but I also try and think about the things that went right and, like, even it's like a nice exchange with someone or you help yep. someone with something. And then in the morning before you grab your phone and start scrolling Instagram or run off to break breakfast with the kids or whatever it might do, I try and set like an intention for who I want to be in that day, what kind of person I want to be. Um, and it, that's kind of higher level than just like your goal setting, I want yeah. to achieve these three tasks. It's about I'm really into and that's why in the shows about this is like once you kind of get yourself right, I think a lot of the goals and a lot of the things fall into place. And we have to constantly, life throws things at you left, right and centre. You don't have, no one has like an easy day. I mean, Mm -hmm. and some are harder than others. But I think if you're like clear about the kind of person you want to be, I want to have integrity. I want to be resilient. I want to spend quality time with my kids. And even if it's an hour, really get on the ground, play with them in my, you know, and, and ask them about the day, but not as a... You know, but like really listen to the yeah. answer. Yeah. And so I think that it's just about reminding yourself on the daily who you want to be, who you are, and that I think keeps you on the right path. Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. Mm, all right. You, let's Shall go. Let's, let's, let's do all right. it. So I'm going to, what are we, how are we going to do this? I'm going to just maybe just stand so up. I think you should take the clothes off and hand them to me. And oh. I'll read them. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We've lost a few listeners and a lot of viewers. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can you, I don't know, this is a, where, can you, Look how nervous you are. You love it, don't you? You're excited. You're not nervous, you're no, excited. You love it, okay. No, just because I did a few little things to trick you. I like it, I like it. Though. All right. Like a trickery. All right. So. All right. Right. So, okay, I'll talk, okay? Mm-hmm. So right now we have, don't give anything away. You've got a lot of interesting things going on. So you've got the double jacket. Let's just mm-hmm. start with that. So you've got the blazer over yeah. the zip up, okay? Yep. And then you've got the black T-shirt. What does the T-shirt say? Can you just see the little well, thing? Uh, yeah, see, what, is it, what does that mean? When yeah. You wear that? Well, statement T-shirt is one of the most clear expressions of like, mm-hmm. it's a direct statement. You know, usually it's implied like, oh, you're wearing a black T-shirt. Yeah. It's like you want to be a little bit hidden. Mm-hmm. But when you actually have a statement top, like with an actual statement, Mm -hmm. it either can be tongue in cheek, which Mm -hmm. shows like a sense of irony and a wink, or it can actually be the statement that they're wearing. It's like, does the work for me. You don't need me if they've got a statement to you. Okay, so black t-shirt and your necklace. Can I see your necklace underneath poking through? Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's my brother's in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... This is one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. That's actually, I bought this Is that Jesus? No, that's not. It's Zeus. Zeus. Oh, okay. Have a look really, Zeus really, the God. Yeah. Yeah. Really closely. It's mm. a piece of jewelry. So that's the, the each on his face. Mm. That's um, the little mosaics. And it's, and it's, I bought this in Mykonos. Love it. Okay. Yeah. So what I see here is 
Okay, so the necklace. Necklace is a very interesting thing. You've kind of got like almost like a dog chain. Uh, it's yeah. not quite, but it's there's something a bit like um, uh, even though you love fashion, mm. you have a lot of testosterone. Like you're very like you want to get. You have a kind of. I don't know, fierceness to you in some ways. It's very driven. And then you have the sentimentality of you, the softness of you as well. So you've got your brother there and you are, you don't let every single person in. In fact, you're actually quite hard. They have to like jump through a lot of hoops to be like, do you think that they're someone of blood? Into... From so <laughs> Is she? <laughs> She's a what are they called? Like, uh, yeah, it's a like what is it called when they can move their body in different parts? She's in a condo. We won't talk about that. Um, so, so I think you're someone who is very, very actually sentimental, but not to many things. Mm -hmm. It's like family first and friends that feel like family and everyone else really doesn't have any space mm -hmm. at the table for you. It's actually yeah. a small, small group, but yeah. once they're in, they're in. And you yeah. can be quite vulnerable. If they hurt you, it really hurts yeah. because you've dropped your armor. Because for everyone else, you have a lot of armor. You've got a double blazer on. So there's a part of you that's like very business, very... Um, meticulous in terms of how you do in fact you're meticulous in general things have to be done a certain way I'm blocking, I'm blocking um, you're blocking me see oh, it's all it's all about you though isn't it and i'm just kidding <laughs> i'm only kidding okay that's fine no that's great and then so you have you have the blazer it's kind of a bit of a shorter blazer by the way we should mm -hmm. talk about that it might be a little bit too short anyway and then but it's some it's beautiful it's like a deep navy right is it black mm -hmm. yeah, it's deep navy. deep navy yeah. Deep navy yeah so that's someone who has class there's someone who is a bit old school, connected to their father, traditional stuff. And then you have this kind of zip front thing, which is very forward focusing, which is the opposite. So you're f a contradiction is what you are. So very, what's next for me? You can't sit still. You absolutely feel um, very claustrophobic if you're not in constant forward motioning. That's that, very true. Yeah. Like mm. that's, and yeah, that's, so what's next? What's next? What's next? And you don't, it's interesting. You don't spend that much time looking back, but when it comes to family and people that you really love, then you do. But you often, you distract yourself from any pain by always moving so fast forward. Mm -hmm. And that's worked for you. It's not, yep. a, yeah. Yep. Um, and then you have. So the what rip, do you say, like, like yeah. A, a, and then the rip a, a 48 year old man. Rip jeans. With ripped jeans. Forever like, I, I like young though, but you want to be, you're very rebellious. You don't ever see an expiry date on yourself. Like mm. that you're, you're, and that is part of you always moving forward. Like you have to feel mm -hmm. current, feel relevant. It's very important. Like the greatest insult yeah. would for someone to be like, oh, Joe was really like two years ago. Like that would yeah. kill you. You need to feel like, no, I'm onto the next thing, the biggest mm -hmm. thing. I'm, you know, and, and that, that's part of you. And then the shoes, which are like, a quite like kind of look like shark attack, don't they? But they're ah, Hermes. Ah, <laughs> they're Hermes. So it's they slip on. Things have to be easy. Friendships that are a lot of work, not interesting to you. Yeah. They ha everything has to feel pretty easy. Slip mm -hmm. on, but there needs to be an element of prestige. Like you have to feel like you're with the best and that you are the best. That's very important for you. You would not be comfortable feeling like you were living an ordinary life, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. That would be death to you. Right. Okay. And the watch? The watch, who do you want to be? Oh, my God, well, that's who you want to be. So it's like blinged out. What is it? It's a... Well, it's a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Say it. Don't be afraid. It's a Frank Mueller. Frank Mueller, exactly. Yes, being completely... Blinged, blinged out. out. Okay. So that's, I mean, so you have big, big ambitions, huge ambitions. You want to be like a huge star in in, in the world. What do you that, mean? I thought I was. No, you, in, <sighs> yeah, no, exactly. That's devastating. No, you want to be even bigger, shall we say, <laughs> than you, if that's even possible. Do we need to get out of class? Hang on. And, and you won't stop until you get there and... You, you, and you've always felt that way. And any pain that you have, any rejection that you've experienced, which we've all had, your antidote for it is more and more success. That's how you can heal any kind of pain is just more and more success. Wow. You're bloody spot on, you know. That. <laughs> You're fantastic. You know, yeah. I, I, you know what? This has been a really interesting um, chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so it, much. It's, it, you, you, yeah, you, you know, I can't really fault you at all there. Did you, you know? want to? Did you? Were you no, trying to trick me no. up? Well, why would I want to fault someone like yourself? I mean, you know, that's that's what you do. 
You know, your books yeah. are fantastic. They're, 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 they're you know, big sellers. Mm. You got this TV show mm. by a great producer and so on. I mean, obviously, you know what you're talking about. And that's, yeah. and, and who am I to question yeah. someone like you? I mean, I, I, you know, that's why you do what you do, mm. you know? And, mm. and uh, I'm a big believer in, in just sitting back and saying, well, hang on a minute, who am I questioning here? Mm. You know? This is what you do. You do this day in, day out. Mm. There's a reason why you are there. Mm. There's a reason why I do what I do. There's a reason why I don't do certain things because I'm no good at it. Yeah. But there's a reason why I get yeah, up in front of that many people and make people laugh for two hours. And People are going to look at that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And also the work you put into it, getting to your place, that place and understanding it and then just trusting yourself to to be in that moment and, and to have that human interaction, even though it's – for you, in your case, it's a, a room full of thousands of people, mm. and for me, it's you and you and I one on one. But yeah. it happened to be filmed for for Andres. But it's like at the end of the day, it's just about people and like connecting with the essence and core of who they are, and having them feel seen and heard. Whether it be through comedy because you say something that they've thought and you articulate for the yeah. first time, or me identifying something in them that they have always felt but hadn't acknowledged or kind of again articulated and how that can that's connection and that's ultimately the whole point of life is to find those connections so it's it's yeah it's we're we're lucky we get to do what we do thank you so much and lucky to call you a friend yeah and um look forward to yeah, showing you some more shoes one day. I know. I want to see where they are in your new house. Oh, my God. Oh, they're put away in the new house. There's just no room. It's just a completely different house. But one day we will build a house exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. where I don't have to fight the council. I know. That is hilarious. I love it. My prob- my husband, I'm going to send that to my husband. I'm like, you thought I had a problem. <laughs> yeah, he's, in, he's in war with the council. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thanks.